Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Leah Kozach. I am one of the board members for the Colorado Theater Guild. Uh, I serve on a bunch of committees and I am the current advocacy committee chair. Um, right now I'm gonna ask that if folks are not um, presenting to go ahead and just put their microphones on mute. It's okay if we see you on camera. In fact, we'd love to see you on camera, but we do appreciate if you put yourself on mute just so that way all the attention is on our speakers. Feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat box. And that way we can capture that info for you while folks are talking. Or if you're um, on the more introverted side of things, if you're more comfortable using the chat function versus speaking out loud, that's there for you as well. Uh, my pronouns are Leah, my first name, they and she. I am a white person with brown hair with silver streaks in it. I'm wearing uh, computer glasses tonight. I have a blue uh, cardigan kind of sweater and I have a blurred background of like a mulberry wall with a, a picture behind me. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Hold on one moment. All right, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and give the digital land acknowledgement for the Colorado Theater Guild. Members of the Colorado Theater Guild, individuals and organizations are primarily settled on the unceded territories of the Ute, Southern Ute, Eastern Shoshone, Ocheti Shekawin, Lipan Apache, Jicaria Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, Cheyenne, Pueblos, Diné, Osage, Kiowa, Comanche, and Pari people. You can find out more about the original and continual caretakers of the land you occupy by going to nativeland.ca. I'm gonna put that in the chat for folks so that they can uh, take a look at that at their own time. You can take a look at that now if you wish or later. Um, today we are meeting digitally and we recognize the legacy of colonization embedded in the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we have come to rely on, especially now. We are using electricity, computer equipment, and the internet, which are not always consistently available or available at all in many indigenous communities across and beyond the United States. The devices and infrastructure that we use were made in ways that carry a carbon footprint and contribute to the climate change that disproportionately affects indigenous peoples worldwide. So thank you for listening. We're going to um, go ahead with our next bit. So for any of you who are maybe new to the Colorado Theater Guild, new to Greener Theater Colorado, you can keep uh, abreast of what will be occurring through a couple different channels. One of them will be our social media channels through our website, coloradotheaterguild.org. Um, yeah, so we've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those things. We'll be updating folks along the way. And for all of you who are attending now, and for anyone who registered but couldn't attend tonight and will be watching this later, we'll for sure be sending you more information um, after tonight's session. I'd like to now introduce Megan Holdeman, an environmental advocate and theater advocate that I'm lucky to not only call a collaborator, but a friend who inspired tonight's first meeting to discuss greening our theater practices here in Colorado. Welcome, Megan. Thanks, Leah, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm so excited you're here. Um, seeing all the names like populate as we opened it up for you was really cool. Um, my name is Megan, my pronouns are she, her. I have long brown hair straight with side swept bangs. Um, I'm a white person with freckly skin and I'm wearing a black zip up sweatshirt. Um, I am a sound technician at the Denver Center of the Performing Arts Theater Company. And I am a grad student um, pursuing environmental theater at Miami University. And I would like to welcome you to the first Greener Theater Colorado community discussion. This is the first in many discussions. Um, this is only the start of the conversation. So um, keep a lookout for all the other things that we're gonna keep doing. Um, we wanted to have this community discussion to uh, learn from each other, to talk to each other about a really big scary topic that is sometimes really hard to talk about and that we don't often talk about 
in the workplace, um, a lot of times because it's such a polarized topic, and to get ideas about what we want to actually start doing as a green theater community. And we, Colorado Theater Guild, Leah, Ben, and I, um, we want to listen and learn about what you are all, th all are thinking about um, as far as climate change and theater, the intersection goes. So tonight's structure, we have a couple guest speakers and we will hear from one before each discussion prompts. So we're gonna hear from Chicago Green Theater Alliance, then send you to a breakout room for the first prompt, come back together with anything we wanna talk about as a big group and then hear from the next speaker and so on. We will give you about 15 minutes in the breakout rooms to discuss, but you can also come back to the big room whenever you feel like you're done discussing in your small group. Um, and Leah, Ben, and I will be popping out through popping through breakout rooms, so you can always ask us questions or put questions in the chat, whatever you want during those discussions. Um, it's it's really not supposed to be. It's not pressure. It's not a presentation. It's literally just, hey, we're all interested in this topic. Let's get together and talk about it. So for our first speaker um, tonight, we have Cass Westover, who is a key member of the leadership team of the Chicago Green Theater Alliance. Um, that's one of the chapters of the Broadway Green Alliance, and it's one of the older ones. It was founded in 2014. Um, Cass is going to talk about Broadway Green Alliance and what it means to be part of a greener theater organization ecosystem. So let's welcome Cass. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, hey there, I'm Cass Westover. Like like Megan said, my pronouns are she, they. Um, I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt and a vest. My skin is pale and I have short dark hair. Um, before I spoke on behalf of the Chicago Green Theater Alliance, I called Nan Zabriskie, the woman whose thesis championed the creation of the CGTA. Um, and I'm so glad I called her too, because being a leader then is exactly like being a leader now, um, except that it's totally different. You know, and that is to say having her perspective um, was great because I'm able to look at the collective current challenges uh, facing me and my organization um, and find some solace there. So I hope to bring a little bit of that solace to you today. Um, this past Earth Week, I tuned into a virtual launch party um, for the Creative Green Tools Canada which is like a free online tool for arts organizations to record, measure, and understand the impacts of their art making from travel to materials and operations and all that. Um, and it was built in partnership with Julie's Bicycle, which is the first, I believe, of, to provide tools like that. Um, and it was created in London in 2007. So during this launch, everyone's so excited. Um, Julie's Bicycle founder, Alison Tickell, offered that culture needs to be at the heart of climate change or climate work, sorry. Um, and for many of us in cities across the United States, I think climate activists are faced with an uphill ba battle of people who don't give a crap about environmentalism. Throughout the CGTA's growth, we get derailed and disheartened when colleagues, you know, throw out and unbroken down box, cardboard box in the trash receptacle. Like, how are we supposed to deal with that? So as I was thinking about these challenges in our capacity for greening, I was reminded myself that the cultural challenge is happening in the theater arts in general, of course. Over the past two years, many of us have been reevaluating how the theater industry should work. You know, we've been reflecting on the critical demands of we see you white American theater, that whole collective. Um, we've been wondering if we should do 10 out of 12 still. I'm sure all of us are wondering if we'll ever see true integration of eco-conscious practices in the arts overall. And, and perhaps we're even thinking about the age old question of what are the arts for? To entertain us with old stories, if we make new work, who is that for, you know, and who's going to do it. So all of these thought roller coasters led me to our, our culture drives the arts and the arts drive our culture, right? It's the whole chicken and egg thing and anything worth doing will be tough, but I can guarantee you, you won't realize all the people you've inspired along the way. Um, we're making the change that we want to see in the world and it's not easy but we're doing it by example and we're doing it on a lot of fronts right now so um in theater and everywhere established culture is obviously a huge roadblock to making positive changes 
Um, now we're going back to Nan. In 2014, Nan knew she couldn't create the chapter on her own. If she was the only one raising her hand for climate justice, you know, she could push some new ideas, but you know, she wasn't gonna get very far. Um, and at the end of the day, she told me that she was just pleased enough to be bringing the idea of greening to the arts community. How would it resonate with them? You know, where would it go? What, who would be the most active and passionate about it? Um, so I can tell you a couple of things about where it went, what happened over the past eight years, we have gained a huge following on social media. Our chapter is actually really production heavy um, because that's where most of our membership came from. Um, we built an active Facebook group that shares strike information and material reuse opportunities from across the city, nearby Burbs, and um, even in Milwaukee, um, Wisconsin, and um, um, Michigan. And we um, we also built a free online resource quiz, which is no more. It died, but it was based on this really cool toolkit. So our quiz would give you a carbon footprint score of your shop. And then based on whatever metals, woods, paints, lamps, fabrics, dyes you use. And then along with your score, it would give you um, replacement opportunities for things that you can replace to have a lower, to lower your score. Um, and then this last year, 2021, we held two blowout drop and swap events. Um, collecting and redistributing a number of things for re reuse and recycle, which were really good for the soul. Um, last October, our sixth annual e-waste and textile drive, we collected and processed about 6,000 pounds of clothes. Um, 4,000 pounds of it, uh, about, um, were actually redistributed to the public. So we got theaters to donate costumes, and then the public also brought in clothes, and it was a big event. It was over the course of three days and 12 hours, 500 people, lots of numbers, very exciting. And all of this is volunteer led, which is a blessing and a curse, you know? So Nan couldn't have known what it would be. Um, the Broadway Green Alliance has a greater toolkit for show runners, you know, mostly stage managers, actors, crew members. Um, and each chapter really ends up being a reflection of their community as you would, you know, as you build a greater community across Colorado, you might know how that will suss out, like in what pockets different things will occur. Um, and that's exciting. Um, at the end of the day though, Nan reminds me that the organization must not crumble if certain folks move on and leave the group, very important. This especially spoke to me because during the pandemic, Nan has retired to the Pacific Northwest. Um, another co-founder of the CGTA has changed fields and he moved to the Rockies. So he's with your lot now. And then suddenly, or was it slowly, theater came back. And of all the people in our leadership team, I'm the only one who decided not to go back to the rewarding, demanding and stressful culture of theater making. So I'm over here, like ready to start new projects with the CGTA, but most of my team doesn't have time, even if we're not doing 10 out of 12s. So it can feel hopeless. But there's good news. You know, it's not actually hopeless. Um, people like us exist everywhere. And oftentimes we want to help. So um, here are my little bits of advice. Um, at the CGTA, we found it necessary to have active engagement opportunities at every commitment level. So we can have some databases on G Suite that everyone can contribute to. If you listen to your community, you might discover that a number of theaters all have to get rid of their vinyl banners and recycle those in mass. Um, or you can just post greening tips, which is cool. You can compile, compile an annual newsletter across the entire year and send that out to your membership, all kinds of opportunities, but it's not hopeless. Um, <laughs> I'm like telling myself that, no, it's true. Um, I just wanna reiterate that if you find yourself alone in a room raising your hand for climate justice, you should maybe step outside and listen to your community and what they need. Um, it's not to say that you would abandon your post, but just remember that you don't have to save the world. 
you can't, only one person can't run the show, you know? So prioritize small steps. Don't overpromise to yourself and others. Um, invite passionate people of any, you know, uh, background to your leadership meetings. Um, more voices is always better. And centering your community in your work, which means your community's capacity, passions, and limitations um, will keep you in the strong footing of your objectives. Best of luck to you. And come visit us in Chicago. Thank you so much, Cass. That was really helpful to have like tangible understanding of your process as well as you know a nice hopeful message at the end. And it is true to remind people that um, it's not one person's job to figure this out. It's impossible. Um, and that's how people burn out. It is absolutely a coalition effort. So thank you for sharing. I will uh, give you all just a quick little reminder about the tech stuff for the breakout room. So what's going to happen is you'll be assigned automatically into a couple different breakout rooms. And um, like we said, you'll have about 10, 15 minutes to talk through the prompt that we're going to share with you in a little bit. And then you come back into the room, the main room, and we'll get in with the next speaker. So as things are going on, like, please take notes, put things in the chat. Um, keep the conversation going with your peers. If there's something that you absolutely want to share after your breakout room, we're going to have a little buffer period for people who do want to share what was talked about in those sessions to do so. Um, but don't feel obligated to if you don't want to. But that's why we have that chat space so that if you're thinking of something later based off of what someone has said, um, we can capture that for you. All right, and so we're going to start off the conversation tonight by just thinking over climate change as a whole. So what do you think about climate change? How much do you know about what's happening and why? And how does it make you feel? And we've copied that into the chat so you don't have to remember those questions, but I'll see you in a breakout room. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I think right now, let me just see where we're at. Okay, so I think we're, we're ready to have our, if anyone has anything from those breakout room sessions that they would like to share either in the chat or you can raise your hand and take yourself off mic. But if not, you know, the chat's open for you to share that stuff um, as we get ready for our second speaker. Mm -hmm. All right. So if there's nothing we want to talk about, um, my, our next speaker, um, in my second week working at the Denver Center, um, I stood up at an all company meeting to tell everyone about a future we create, which was the event I produced in December, the climate, the climate theater production, and my intentions to start the Colorado chapter of the Broadway Green Alliance. And that night I got an email from a carpenter in the company saying, yes, I wanna be a part of it. Whatever you're doing, I wanna help. And the first time I talked to her in person, um, she told me a story about her attempts to prevent set pieces from going to the landfill. And I thought it would be perfect for us to hear that story. So I would like to introduce Wynn Pastor. Hello, um, I am Wynn Pastor. I use she, her pronouns. I am a scenic technician and scene shop purchaser at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. I, have, I am a white woman with long brown hair, a maroon v-neck t-shirt. Um, I think that's the basics about that. Um, so yes, I, I did tell Megan the story and I feel like I should preface it with this happened six years ago. Um, and I had just begun working at the Denver Center. I had been there for a few months as over hire, but I was working in the positions that I have now for only a few weeks. And we started to strike the show Sweet and Lucky, which was one of our largest immersives that we 
had created at the DCPA at that point. And it took place in a warehouse that I believe was 16,000 square feet. So it had multiple sets in it. Actually, Alex Billman could correct me on that, I bet. He knows all the numbers, but we'll just go with that. <laughs> um, and so I start, so there were, there were legitimately sets all over this warehouse. Um, and we used a lot of materials that we had had in our warehouse originally. Um, and I started to ask about, cause we just started getting a dumpster, you know, huge roll up dumpsters and things were just going into the dumpster left and right. And I, I asked about um, like, could schools possibly use our set pieces? Um, and I was told that um, there used to be a program at the Denver Center where high schools could come and pick up our used sets and that that had to be canceled because certain schools complained about other schools getting the benefit of it. And it, it involved like an entire restructure that nobody was really willing to do to figure out how to make it fair. And so they just canceled it all together. So they're like, so everything goes in the dumpster. Um, and I tried really hard um, during those weeks of strike to make sure that some pieces went. I, I posted on Facebook and Craigslist, I, you know, certain pieces that I was like, these would be great in the house or certain materials I would lay out and I would tell people it's free, come and get it. Um, and thankfully my boss was very tolerant of it. And he would give me like a day. He's like, okay, these pieces, you got a day before they have to go in the dumpster. Um, and sometimes the products were gotten and sometimes they weren't. Um, but towards the end, part of this set was a number of different rooms and um, there were doors to these rooms. And when we struck, we had about 27 hollow core doors and I was desperate to keep them out of the landfill. They were in fantastic condition and um, I started calling around. I, I did the posting, um, I called Habitat for Humanity, I called Habitat Restore, a number of thrift stores, nobody took hollow core doors. They were like, they're trash doors, you know, we don't want those. Um, and again, I had about a day and a half to find someone. And I got really excited because I found a company that could do it. And it was this amazing organization that built homes for veterans. And they were beyond thrilled to hear from me and hear that I had these doors. Um, but they, they relayed to me that they were between warehouses. Um, so if we could hold on to the doors for four to eight weeks, then they would love to have the doors. And that was not an option. And those doors went into the trash. Um, and I was heartbroken and I, you know, cause I really, I put a lot of effort into it and I, um, I was just so excited that somebody could use them. And then just because we couldn't, we didn't have a place to store them, it was no longer an option. So I was a little devastated. This is clearly stuck with me. So I shared it with Megan. Um, and, and that is in essence, my story. I, um, I mentioned earlier um, before this began that I have a dream <laughs> and they said, share your dream. So, um, this situation in particular, among others of scenery just being tossed, um, my dream is that there is a nonprofit organization that gets created that has a warehouse that can that is specific for reuse of theater. Um, props warehouses exist. People borrow and rent props all the time. But if we could come up with something similar to that, that had, you know, basic platforms and flats and legitimately just materials um, there, it's so often when we take apart a set, we've got great two by fours and some of them get recycled. Many of them do not. Um, all types of material. And so I feel like if we could come up with a, 
a nonprofit that does that and is funded because the materials are donated because they were going to go in the trash anyway. And then these materials were sold off at a much discounted price than they would be in the stores. Then, and I am not a financial person. So maybe somewhere along the line, there can be a balance to provide money for the warehouse and for the people who work there. Um, that's my big idea that I've done nothing with. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if anybody, I should, I see that there are things, chats. I don't know if anybody has a question. Oh, Atlantic Green Theater has a barn for this type of thing. That's awesome. We do have so much space in Colorado. I feel like it's possible to do something like this. When, when I used to work in high school theater, you know, and I was TDing for a few different high schools, I had the same thought, you know, and it was similar. I had the same thought, like within the Jeff Cool school system, they need to do something like this. Cause we would spend so much time, like teaching kids how to build like flats and platforms. And inevitably you could only store so many of them and we're rebuilding them all the time. But like, we don't, no one wants to waste their time building flats that don't need to be rebuilt that you know if this place could have you know 100 four by eight flats you know that kind of thing and some like four by 12 ones that you could come in and take them do what you need to do with them and also a staircase of this height and you know basic things like that and what you're talking is kind of a bigger idea of that that branches out into like community theater but this is like so needed for the high schools so many of these schools like they they don't have anything and they don't have kids that or people that can teach these kids how to build these things. So I'm just yeah. going to say that. That's a great, like there could be an additional part of this where kids could come and learn how to build parts of sets or learn yes. about. And I, you know, I thought of it too, is like, this could be a bigger warehouse that had a bigger variety of tools that all had stop saws that were safer. Right. And like, you know, these schools have small shops. They don't have a lot, but if these, you know, like we have this bigger project. So we're going to take on this Saturday, we're going to take, you know, these 10 kids to this shop, you know, and I'm sure this place would have, you know, adults that know how to use these things and could teach them, but we're going to do this project over here. Right. And then there's a truck, right. That could bring that to the theater and they can finish it up over there and do what needs to be done. Um, and it would also teach them a little bit more how like the professional world works as far as, you know, scenery getting built. And where I got this idea from is that Jeffco school system has a Jeffco costume shop and it's basically just a it's a costume shop and you can go in you know and say I need these dresses for my show and I'm going to take these it's free for it because it's run by Jeffco there's a couple volunteer ladies that run it we just need to make that bigger but with scenery I love that I think that's great <laughs> taking some notes away here because yeah, what I wrote into the chat was that a, a number of us on the CTG board have been discussing some kind of project where it would be like a warehouse database portal where we would be able to track what those things are. So if you're a member of CTG, you'd be able to have access at a nominal fee or possibly free. Like we haven't finalized anything. It's just been conversation. But when, you know, this whole undercurrent of having more conversations like this came about, that was certainly one of the things I wanted to bring to the, the follow-up meetings is like, these are the things that we were envisioning. And our issue is, you know, like we have some of the infrastructure, but we don't have all the folks available to, you know, facilitate all of that. So that's where you have like volunteer groups initially. And eventually we would like to have somebody um, who has some authority to be able to like sign those things out, who would be there all the time, or we have people on a rotating basis. So all of these are just ideas at this point. But if we have this group of people who are all saying, yes, we really do want this service, then we just need to figure out how do we make that service happen? How do we find the space to host all of that stuff? How do we make sure it's all insured and safe and so that people aren't gonna break in and take things? Um, so yeah, this is a great beginning of that plan. So Wynn, do you have anything else you wanted to share or any other big dreams other than what you <laughs> shared with us? I mean, you shared a pretty big dream. It's, it's an incredible dream. Um, so I want to give space for that. But if there was anything else you wanted to share. 
Um, I think that's the big one that I tend to focus on the most. It would just be um, something that Megan had actually suggested at one point too, is the idea of even having, if, if there's not a warehouse that can store stuff, having someone who can connect different places like, oh, well, this place needs these things and this place is getting rid of these things. Let's connect them together so that they can arrange that. Um, I feel like that would be a good way to start without having um, a, a warehouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanna put in here that um, our the Facebook group has been really successful, but the two things that I would prefer, one, that it's not on Facebook, but you know that's kind of a problem because there isn't there isn't necessarily something that people check every day. If they do, you know it's it's convenient ish. What's the other thing? The Facebook thing is kind of a big one. Oh, it's again it's a cultural question. When do you start with your strike plan? And when do you let people know that things are available? You know, all too often it's like in two days or else. And it's like, right. Come on. <laughs> you know, but but I, I still think you can get something going with that kind of reuse with communication only. It won't be as robust, but strike parties. Or just everybody knows when everybody's strike is and where it's happening and things will all go out on the street and everybody can just come shop around. Yeah, I love like, that. Yeah, like the Mile High Flea Market, but for for theater equipment stuff. Yeah, I love that. Um, Kelly, you have your hand raised. What would you like to share? Yeah, um, just kind of branching off of this, this is why I also think it's important to build our or to build our theaters with the people directly in the community. Because when I was tearing down this the set of Rattlesnake Kate, I text my professor who was right across the street. I'm like, "Hey, do you guys need this material? Can I just leave it next to the dumpster so you come and kind of take what you want?" Um, but managing to have people within different theaters that are spread out that can spread that message of hey we have these materials for use um i think it's at least like a little step we can take that's wonderful yeah i mean that's i think that's the undercurrent that we're sharing here is that sometimes these things happen very quickly and we're just going through our networks of people that we know who could respond in that kind but if there was a system in place where there's some pre-planning element or there's some portal, like you said, cast that is not Facebook, that is managed somewhere else because we cannot be at the mercy of social media conglomerates for our information sharing. It's a helpful tool, but things change. So having something that is more neutral um, than one social media platform is, is, a, is a big goal. So I, I hear you on that. Um, yeah, and finding other people who have either physical space or have tangible folks who can help manage that process of getting started is, is one of our major goals. So thank you all for, for sharing with that. I'm gonna lead us into our next uh, breakout session and our next prompt. So same thing will happen. We'll have you all randomly assigned to a different group. We'll go for about 10 to 15 minutes and then folks will come back and we can have conversations if needed, or we can move on to the next part. So the next prompt is what role do you think theater can and should play in fighting climate change? I'll go ahead and put that in the chat for everybody so that you can see that, but that's something to ponder for the next chunk of minutes because for the most part, most of us in this session have had some experience with, you know, the larger structures of theater. We haven't just done one production, like we've been part of various ecosystems. So we have a frame of reference to talk about this. So um, David will get us into some breakout rooms in just a minute. So hang tight and we will see you in a bit. Never enough time. Never, ever, ever. Now, what I was saying in the group, because I was right at the end, I said that being challenged can be generational and cyclical, 
based on economic and political systems around the world and classism too. So that's where we were at that point. Yeah, and that's just a glimpse. We had we had real talk in group one. <laughs> we got into some labor questions. Um, all right, so does anyone else want to um, share anything vocally? Or if not, again, feel free to put stuff in the chat. We're gonna be capturing that. Um, and sharing notes with folks at a later point once we are able to really synthesize that in a cohesive way. Uh, one thing that came up in group two was just how to amplify the efforts in a beyond theater. And the um, uh, a request was to explain what the SCFD is for those who may not know. Um, the SCFD stands for Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. It is a tax in our seven county area that is approved by voters. It's a one tenth of 1% sales tax that directly goes back and funds around 300 art and cultural organizations in that seven county area. Um, it brings in about $70 million per year and is pretty much the envy of the country. So. Um, one point I'll make is that if this is going to work anywhere, it's going to work in Denver and in the seven county area because we already have such great support and buy in from our cultural community. Um, but one project that we have at the tier one and two level with with a couple of tier threes and the tiers are are um, funding levels within that tax is a collective database. So it was the question was about how many people this cause would be speaking to very, very directly. And if you really broaden beyond theater to, to our larger cultural community, that database of our buyers represents more than half of the entire Denver metro area. So we have people who are probably very primed to be advocates when we are ready to, to get and reach them with different compelling stories. So it's kind of exciting to think that we might just have some folks in our back pocket. That's so true, Suzanne. And yeah, absolutely, SCFD. I talk with people all over the country and when they hear about the story of how it got started in the 80s and how it has shifted over time and what we're doing now and that like on a government level, there's a commitment saying we value this and we understand the tax implication with it and we're gonna not get rid of it. People do like salivate at that. They're like, how can I get something like that started? I said, find a group of arts workers who all want that to be the case and talk with your representatives. Like if they don't know that you want something like that, they're not gonna start it. It has to come from you. So now um, I'm gonna hand things over to Megan she is our third speaker this evening to give much more of a comprehensive understanding of like why we're here tonight, how this all started and um, some of her own goals and aspirations. So take it away, Megan. Man, we sure blew a lot of the things that I was gonna talk about out of the water. I'm like so happy that I'm kind of crying a little bit right now. Um, so when we started planning this event, I, I just kept like, my part of it, I was like, oh, I'll just go, I'll talk about what my vision is for Greener Theater Colorado and what that means to me. And of course I have these big dreams like the community warehouse, which I, I literally wrote into my speech, the community warehouse. The only thing I have to add to what we talked about earlier is warehouse parties because having a warehouse that has all of these things that are stored in it is one thing, but knowing what's in the warehouse is another. So we could have these crazy theater themed parties where we just like, we've got all sorts of random stuff. We can do anything we want with the party. And then people are hanging out at the warehouse. And then in your next production meeting, you're like, you can be like, oh, you know, I remember seeing that thing at the warehouse. That thing would be really perfect for this thing for this show. And having people actually spend time at the warehouse and not have it just be this like, cold, lonely, far away thing, be something that's actively engaged in the community as much as any different venue is. And um, then, and of course there's, there's a lot of things that like, there's a, a whole laundry list of check boxes that, that would make us more sustainable. You know, how much paper do we print? Are we using rechargeable batteries? Um, throwing away the sets, how do we use energy? All of those things that are like, it's easy to say, okay, these are the things we need to do. 
in order to become a sustainable theater community. But when, when, one of the biggest things about my grad school program, which is a community engagement based program, is um, how, to, how to actually lead change is to shut up and listen. We literally watched a TED talk that was like all about you just shut up and listen. Researchers have this tendency to walk into a community and they're like, okay, here's the plan. I know what needs to happen. And those plans have a tendency to fall apart after the researcher leaves because they didn't ask for the input of the community members. They gave the community members no decision-making power. So why would, why would it keep going? No one has any buy-in, no one has any investment in the project. And the researcher is a lot more likely to miss something because they don't live in that community. The community members have information about what is what does the day-to-day -day situation look like? Or, you know, as a researcher, I might be like, oh, this isn't happening because they don't have this thing or they don't have this information and make assumptions about what the community is missing or not missing. And the community is like, no, actually, we know this, th this, we are just missing this resource or access or whatever it may be. So really, when I just when I decided that what I should do was start this chapter, I've always had that in mind. I'm anybody who knows me knows I'm not like I'm not gonna just like tell you what to do. I don't I don't want to come in and tell you what to do because I don't I don't necessarily know. I don't pretend to know all the answers. So really, my vision for this organization is to fill a need in the community, which means I need to find out what is the need in the community. Um, we have a pretty clear long-term goal, obviously reduce the waste we produce and reduce the energy we use, but how we actually get there isn't up to me. It's not up to Leah or Ben. Um, how we get there is by helping you, the actual members of the community, get the tools, the knowledge, the resources, whatever it is that you need to get you there, where you want to go in whatever facet of theater you're in, whatever theater you work, work in, whatever department you work in. Um, we want to create an organization that actually works for you, a resource, a network of people like you for people like you. You're all here because you thought environmentally friendly theater sounded like a good idea and you wanted to learn more about it, or you wanted a space to talk about it, or I literally just wouldn't shut up about it and you're like, I better register for this event. So really, and, and this Everything we've talked about so far is so perfect because what I want Greener Theater Colorado to be is a network, a place that you know you can go when you have an idea, a question, a concern, whatever it is, and you can talk to other people about it, you can find the resources you need to make it happen, you can find the people that make you feel like you're not alone, and you are inspired by others and you build off of each other, and then that network just gets bigger and bigger and eventually it becomes a path for all of the theaters around us to share ideas, to share knowledge, to start sharing materials and resources. And all of that leads to us being a more sustainable community as a whole. So what I love about the Broadway Green Alliance is that it's not an organization that says this is how you need to change. Change is hard and scary for everyone all the time, no matter what, even when you're ready to change and you wanna change, it's still very scary and very hard. And coming in and saying, this is what you need to do. You need to change, you're not doing enough, which is oftentimes how, what I feel like I'm saying to people, you're just gonna get pushback and it's really hard and you're gonna exhaust yourself and, and in the end, it's never gonna be the right path. So, the, the Broadway Green Alliance isn't about forcing change, it's about creating a path for the people who do want to change. So when you sign up to be a green captain, um, they don't say, here's what you do to be a green captain. They say, here are some ideas to get you started. Let us know how we can help you. And now you're connected to a network of people who are also doing this work. So in Colorado, we're really far away from that network. Like I didn't know about the Broadway Green Alliance. The Broadway Green Alliance was founded in, in 2008. It's been around for a long time. There's been 100% participation in the Green Captain program since 2012. So like this movement is very much alive and well in the heart of the United States theater and, and in other places, Julie's Bicycle also, I, and we won't get into all of that, but um, I didn't even know about it until I was in grad school and I was like, huh, theater and, and climate change and I found them so by creating a chapter here we're expanding their network we have access to them and their resources but then you have access to us 
And because we are closer to you, I'm hoping that removes another obstacle that maybe you were facing or whatever it is that you feel like you were missing to being like, you know, I really want to do this thing, but I'm scared. I'm tired. I don't have this thing. I don't know this piece of information. Greener Theater Colorado, hey, what can, can you help me with this? And, and then we'll be like, yeah, let's figure it out. So this event was organized just to start the conversation, to hear what you all think, your questions, concerns, ideas. And then in the next few months before the next meeting, we can start putting together a framework for the organization that you need us to be. And with each discussion, we'll learn something new, we'll plant seeds in each other, and we'll get just a little bit closer to actually being sustainable. And then we wanna learn and grow with you to become a, a thriving greener theater community together. So it's it's really where we're creating a community more than anything else. It's not some nonprofit organization. That is probably what we're going to have to be for fundraising purposes and all of those things, but this is a community and it can, can be a community right now without any approval from anyone. It is a community right now because you are all here talking with me about it. And it's very, very exciting. And with that, we have one more discussion that we're gonna send you all out into. So I want you to think about the process of theater making from production meetings to rehearsals, to shop builds, tech shows, box office, patron experience, anything that you can think of in theater. What are the things you notice happening that can and should be better? What do you observe theaters doing that contribute to the problem or combat the problem? And do you have any ideas? All right, yeah, so we've got that there in the chat. Same thing, you know the drill. We're gonna go into breakout session number three and be back in about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, yeah, same drill. Does anyone have anything they wanna share from their sessions? Keep putting stuff in the chat, like someone was asking about that, it will be saved. So anything that was in I don't know if there's, in terms of the breakout space, I'm trying to think if there's everything that's gonna be captured. So that leads me to my next point that if for some reason, something important that you were talking about in your breakout sessions didn't end up in the chat, we have um, this really great Google form that my, my buddy Ben here created for us. I'm gonna put that into the chat right now. And you'll be able to access that now. You can put things in now. You can do it later over the week. And then we'll send an email to folks with that same information too, just in case you don't capture this or you're having an issue with Google. Um, when, yeah, I see you'd like to share some stuff. So just go ahead and unmute yourself, Win. Where did you go? Hi, sorry. I'm back. Okay, now I can hear you. Um, excellent. I feel our group, I feel like came up with some really fun and cool ideas. And I'm like, are we solving a bunch of issues right now? So um, one of the things, so I'm just going to kind of list them off. So one of the thing is having um, water fill centers, um, similar to they have like at the airport, where um, so instead of being able to just buy bottles of water, you can go and you can fill up your water bottle with filtered water. Um, and if you're not making money off of selling bottles of water, they, um, concessions can have, you know, an inexpensive reusable, like aluminum bottle that you can buy so that you can then go and fill it up. Um, that was one. One is having- I would love a branded DCPA fill-upable bottle. Right? Totally. I think that would be really cool. I, I always agree. bring my Yeti cup in and you have to show that it's empty, but like that only, only in the Buell has like the fast right. one. Yep. Totally. So we could definitely have that in the, the theater company theaters. Um, downloading uh, programs. Um having a QR code so that you don't have to have a bajillion programs. Um, and we kind of like expanded from there that there could be um, like video links in the QR code so that actors can have like, if you want to know more about an actor, maybe they create a little video where they talk about the different things that they've done and what they enjoy. Um, and like what, I don't know an actor who wouldn't love to have that opportunity. 
and um, video and and if people still want to get a program that you could charge like a dollar or two dollars and you could even have it so that when you order your ticket you need to pay that money so then the theater has some idea of how many actual programs they need so they're not just creating a ton of them um oh and another one that was really fun was advertise and and i would like to say I'm, I'm not taking credit for these ideas this is like our group and i'm just sharing um another one was advertising props and wardrobe during the show like if there's some sort of thing that says you know we're not going to be using these pieces of of wardrobe or these props um that and like come on to our site and you know, bid for it or come back during strike day and we'll give you these pieces or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, yeah. The other note I have is Golden Girls Puppet Show, which by the way, I know very little about, but I was like, oh my goodness, I want to check that out. <laughs> so thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Anybody else, anyone want to share out to the group? I'm seeing lots of great stuff in the chat here. Like I said, we're going to capture as much of this as we can. I'm going to be able to save it here and sift through it over the next couple of days. So when you get that email, we'll have some uh, organization to it. Ryan, I see your hand raised. And then uh, Dr. Cody, you're, you're next. Yeah, I'll just, um, since Wynn just called me out on my Golden Girls Puppet Show experience, uh, I will piggyback off of her idea that she brought up earlier in her presentation which i just thought there's probably a for-profit model of some sort where you know theaters with set pieces can have a you know stake like a consignment business where those set pieces go there and there's another revenue stream after the show has ended when those pieces are either rented or purchased by another show or by a school or, or whoever might might get those but i think you could you know it'd be interesting to build a business they had some cooperation from multiple theaters in the area where their set pieces could go to to have another life and you know those items could keep coming back and that the the revenue from a rental or a sale could be split you know between the warehouse's operation costs and the theater that created or provided them uh, i said there's something interesting there um and i'll i will not complicate it by going on and on but i've got some other thoughts cooking in my brain on it but i think something like that could be interesting yeah man put that on simmer have it think it over um cody yeah and i was even just an idea from that too um i know like high schools have so much issues with like getting enough set material and getting enough uh you know props and things like that i mean even if there was something um on the like high schools side where like district by district there's like a pool that they can share all that material for that would be first of all is amazing um but something that we brought up in our discussion as well um it's a little less of like tangible ideas but we um it's just i i have a lot of social worker friends so like i always want to talk about systems theory but like um systemically too we also went into the discussion in our group about um honestly when it comes down to leadership structures within um companies um, because, uh, a lot of times, you know, you've got to wonder, um, about like where, you know, what is the purpose of this theater company? What is the, what is the structure looking like? Like who's at the top? Is it the financial people who are making the decisions? Um, is it the artistic people who are making the decisions? And we also talked, um, I brought up in our group about, um, a solidarity of the why about the why of your organization. Because I mean, if, if we are, you know, I, I, I truly believe that if we are involved in the industry of theater, um, in, the, in the, you know, culture of theater, I mean, our, our goals should be situated about around cultural change, uh, cultural challenge, um, challenging the norms, creating new ideas, putting out new ideas. And if your why is more based around making money, or things like that, you know, then I'm thinking, you know, leadership wise, it's a lot easier, first of all, to cut corners, because if you're more interested in profits, as opposed to, 
um, doing things the right way, doing things from a central system of values, um, it's much easier for you to make the wrong decisions. But then also having solidarity within that why. How is you know the structure, how is the leadership um, trickling these ideas through the structure. I mean, and is it, you know, is it a vertical structure? Is it a um, more horizontal structure where there's accountability and safety within expressing new ideas and trying out new things? But um, I, I tend to find within organizations, if there's conflicts on your central why, that there's a lot of friction and a lot of things that happen down the line within, you know, the people who implement the ideas or come up with the ideas and then the people who are actually executing them. But yeah, just food for thought. Excellent. Anyone else? Okay. I well, feel like we could just bounce off of each other's like ideas forever and like keep sure. that excitement going. And so I love the idea of that, um, that Google Drive document or whatever, as like we're falling asleep and being like, oh, and another thing. Yeah, um, I've been looking at a couple different systems where it's something that is less intrusive than email. It's something you can pop into and out of, and it has structure. So like Discord or Stack or something similar. We're gonna talk oh, about yeah, that's great. finding a, an ecosystem that's gonna be a little better so that people can check in when they want and how they want. Um, and that, yeah, for the folks who maybe because there are people who don't have Gmail and who have no interest in Gmail. So we want to find something that's a little more neutral. Um, but yeah, this will could definitely be continuing. This is not the end. We'll have something that can create a, a more constant flow until we can have another in person, either digitally or physically in person, um, if we can make that feasible. Uh, given COVID constraints right now, like that's why we're doing this digitally right now. We want to make sure everybody who can participate remotely um, in that way. So and I think moving forward, having a hybrid option too, because like I don't always have the ability to get to downtown or wherever, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So if there is something that's in person, that there would be some other digital recording of it or capturing of it so that if people are chiming in from separate from a space that they can, uh, uh, yeah, I'm all in on that. Well, we're hitting, we're at the almost two hour mark. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Megan, Ben, do you have anything you'd like to, to say to folks before we uh, end the evening? My heart is so full. This is, I don't, if you've been watching me at all, I've been gritting like an idiot for the last hour because this is exactly what this was supposed to be. There are so many ideas. And also there are so many people here from DCPA alone that I'm like, yes, 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 yes. And more yes. And so like, let's make an organization that like makes all these things possible and make them happen. And like, you are going to be my community for it. And let's keep talking. Let's keep having these conversations. We're going to have another one and maybe we can figure out how to have them more often eventually. Obviously it's kind of like love to do it, you know, every month or something like that, but it's a little bit crazy at this point. So um, I just wanted, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all showing up and engaging in these amazing conversations. Um, thanks for making my dream come to life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking it's we, when we were initially planning this, we were kind of thinking seasonal, like doing a quarterly thing. Cause it's easy to think of spring, summer, autumn, winter. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to put it on pause until that meeting occurs. Like, I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that needs to happen over these next couple months, but we can do that in a digital space so that people can uh, cultivate stuff and not have to wait until the summer to actually implement some things. Like we have a group of people here who all work together. You can start bouncing ideas off one another and actually putting it into action. And there's stuff that I know we're going to try and do through various committees on CTG and figure some things out and share all of that with folks as we get closer um, towards more of the summertime. So, uh, so yeah, we could have one every time we break record temps. Yeah, I, I think that would mean that we have some pretty frequent meetings, which is great for us, but bad for the planet. Um, but yes, again, thank you everyone for joining us um, to talk tonight. And for those folks who are watching this later, thank you for joining us in that capacity. And uh, we can't wait to 
gather with you again and have a great night. I think Ben had his hand up. Oh, Ben, yes, of course. Sorry, I did. You were off my camera. I'm so okay. sorry. Just really quickly, because Megan, this is awesome. Leah, you guys did a great job. Um, when you when you sent the link uh, that um, that Leah is going to share with you, and she's putting she's putting the thing just to get more feedback. Um, there's a question in there that asks for what are your two top priorities, and it lists a bunch of things. Based on this meeting, we clearly did not cover enough to actually list all of the possible things. So I highly encourage you using the other. Uh, section. If you feel like there's there's a priority that you have that is not listed, um, we were we were just trying to come up with a list of some things to get people's brains flowing. But after this, I think your brains will be flowing plenty. So uh, just don't don't feel limited when you see that list. Please use the other to write in other things that you think should be priorities when you see that question. And just thank you so much for that. Yeah, and that Google form is going to be active for quite some time, so you don't have to respond within like 48 hours or whatever, like take some time, think of stuff, talk with folks, um, it's there for you to use, we'll be capturing stuff as it comes in, and that way as more things get synthesized and organized a little bit, it'll make it easier for you to start implementing some of these great ideas you were sharing with one another. So yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Megan. Thank you to our speakers tonight. Thank you, David, for helping facilitate uh, the Zoom space for us, making it possible so that, you know, I wasn't juggling 50 chainsaws and a bowling ball. And uh, again, yeah, thank you all for coming tonight. We really appreciate it.